successful to a certain degree is his movies are R rated. So you have uh-huh. about time. You have Love Actually. These are, oh, I mean, I don't think Four Weddings and a Funeral was, but he does write like these are both R rated movies. So there is like, you know, Love Actually is there's a lot to that movie. He kind of man, Love Actually, I. Yeah, I'll tell you a story about my last um, time in Korea. Um, I think it was like around Christmas and we were around at a friend's house who had like, you know, teenage daughter, like maybe 12 or 13, like young teenage. And we were like, oh, we'll watch Love Actually. It's like a really oh. good, like kind of Christmassy movie. And we'd completely forgotten about the whole like Martin Freeman, like porn subplot that goes on in that movie. <laughs> I was just like, oh. Crap, this is kind of embarrassing. And, and Laura Linney? It, it was even in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, he uh, adds an edge to it, right? So Four Weddings and a Funeral, Bridget Jones' Diary. They're, the the screenplays and the movie he directs are R. So on the surface, they're almost G-level themes of just like very genteel, very kind, very Richard Curtis verse. But then there's also just a lot of swearing and nudity and drug use. And and it's it, he, he really walks in an interesting line. I, I don't know if you've noticed that where he can, I mean, it's, we, uh, does the, the, am I making sense where there are these very interesting, nice worlds, but then there's also an edge to them, I would say. And do you think well, that's, I think that grinds them in, um, in reality somewhat, you know, you don't have these picture perfect people in a picture perfect world. You have kind of real people in this picture perfect world where they can get away with doing Richard Curtis things but they're also quite real about it. Yeah. And it's an interesting vibe, right? Because it's not a sugar sweet PG-13 tone for a lot of these. No. And yeah, the the themes are some of them are quite adult when you actually look at them. I, and another question, were you living in South Korea when this came out? Yes. And it was huge. Yeah, right. There. What, what do you remember for that? Mass, it was everywhere. Yeah. I, I just remember like seeing all like I didn't really remember it being in theaters, but I remember it was like advertised all over like the TV stations and everything. Like this was the movie to see, and I still don't know what you know what was the thing that sparked such interest in Korea. Like I don't know, you know what was what was it that made this particular movie like the the must see movie in Korea in 2013, but apparently it was like 2 million people went and watched it. It was big, but I, we've, so we've both watched a lot of Korean movies. I mean, there are, I don't know if you have, I, I certainly have, but there's, I've watched a fair few. There's a, it's a much different vibe from cinema here and watching about yeah. time with the kind of mellow, there's some melodrama and there's a bit of fantasy and there's a bit of, uh, what what's the kind of term there's some waifishness about it and you, you see yeah. that in some of these movies what was that uh, love death and robots direct uh, oh yeah park chan Is that the thing Wo- on netflix uh, oh no the, the uh, park TV chan Wo- directed a movie that was very amelie-esque and um yeah that was really popular it had um rain in it and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i remember uh, what was it called yeah i'm looking it up right now and it won some awards, I know that for sure. But it was very... And he even has the poster, Amelie. Oh, I'm a cyborg, but that's okay, in 2006. <laughs> like, that that movie, you go to a mental hospital, and there's some very... There's some extreme violence in it. There's some weird... Like, well, yeah, Korean sequences. movies, they don't... You know, you won't get nudity, but, you know, extreme ultraviolence, for sure. And, <laughs> you know... And, right, but there's a waifishness to it. So do you think that could... Like, just the, the, the melodrama, the dad... You know the relationships. Um, the, well, I, you know, I I think it might have struck a chord with the like family relationship, like the strong kind of family ties that are seen in it. It's like you know this dad who's like really cool. The the son has a really good relationship with this. You know, Rachel McAdams is kind of like the the perfect wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just seems. It seems tailor made to kind of be popular in Korea, and that's not a slight because in the states it only did like fifteen million, if that. In the worldwide, it yeah, made eighty eight million. Quite, yeah, that's quite low, really. Like fifteen. Yeah. It's, sh- it's shocking, right? I mean, it's. But I also think this the, the sentiment of it, right? It was R rated. It 
was this weird hybrid father son type thing. It, it didn't have too many major names aside from McAdams in it. And so you just kind of have Donald Gleason's face on a poster, but the well, scene- yeah, at the time, like all he'd been in was basically like he'd been in a couple of the Harry Potters, I think, and done yeah. a couple of other smaller roles, but he hadn't, he, I don't think he'd been like the lead in anything at that point. So he's, um, it, it, it's just, that's a, it's a really tiny amount and it never got that big of a release. But do you think the the sentiment, the, it's very sentimental, man. It's very, at the end, he's like, you know, I just want to give you a kiss. And then they go walk on the beach together. And it's very yeah. emotional. But I think for a, like almost an American sensibility, that's not us, right? That's not. Yeah. I Yeah. It's very, um, it's quite British, really, I think, mm-hmm. that particular sentiment. Yeah, and so do you think that's maybe why it didn't connect with audiences? Because it wasn't maybe. even a word of mouth hit here. It was in the second weekend drop big. I mean, some sometimes these movies hit, like My Big Fat Greek Wedding. It'll open small, then it'll make a little bit more, a more, little bit more, a little bit more. This one kind of went, boom, boom, and then dropped, and then it was out of the theater before we knew it. So it was interesting. What was it up against? Oh, that's a great question. So this movie was released. I mean, it could have gotten buried. Let's see. So this was 2013, and uh, let's see, 2013. I guess you're right. It could have been. Yeah, it could have been just in a heavy kind of release window where there was some other good stuff that buried it and if it didn't have you know good legs it could have just kind of got buried oh it got it released that might not be it november 2013 movies so november 2013 movies yeah i mean because it had to have been something right because this seems like a tailor-made word-of-mouth hit i would say yeah like most of richard curtis movies have done i think reasonably well stateside Oh, it had some competition, actually. Like, Thor The Dark World came out. Oh, yeah. And then Catching Fire. Yeah, Catching Fire was big. Yeah. So that got released. I mean, those movies all made $300 million. Well, catch- So, yeah, it probably I just got... like, Catching Fire would have eaten up a lot of its audience. Um, I'd say that kind of teen kind of demographic mm-hmm. or, like, young women. It was about time four. That's kind of hard... A hard thing to put your finger on. I think there's something for a lot of different people in there. You know, if you like, 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 like it's not really a comedy, is it? No. Like there there's are cheeky there bits. are funny there are funny bits in it, but it's not a comedy. Like it's and it's not really <laughs> say you know, a very there's not much drama in it either. It's kind of just it kind of sidles along at its own pace, and you just see the relation like it's just about the relation like there's no it's a two-hour movie too yeah it's two hours long but it doesn't feel it when you watch it no it flies by i can't think of another two-hour movie that goes by quicker but it's like you know bridget jones diary romantic comedy yeah Notting hill romantic comedy love actually there's some there's something for literally everybody yeah in love actually so then this one it's the dating doesn't even last that long. He immediate, They kind of immediately, yeah, once he reconciles with her at the party. Yeah, it's basically, okay, and then they have the like scene where they hook up for the first time, and then it's just like, okay, um, now we're at wedding planning, and then I think they had one scene yeah. where he met her parents, and then they were like planning the wedding, and then it was babies, and you know that was it. So it's a weird hybrid then. Yeah. And I guess that's why... Listen, it has a big audience now. People, this movie, I mean, it has a 7.8 score on IMDb. Well, that's, that's big. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's like that, that's a solid score. It, it it has an audience out there. People like it. And I guess maybe people have come to it later on, so there's more of a cult classic vibe to it. But yeah, I mean, I guess that's why. I mean, I I never thought about that before because like like the like the the female characters in it too they're not probably the i mean well, they're not the strongest no. would you say no so then do you think female like female audiences might be like what is this for but then i guess guys who would go watch it are maybe thinking or, yeah, i'm thinking Ameri- in, american in aesthetic your, like, like i'm not watching this romantic comedy in your typical rom-com you always get the female's perspective on things whereas in this you never get to see Rachel McAdams perspective on tim on anything she's only in scenes with tim like you never have a scene with her and her friend off talking about other things nope she doesn't have any friends aside from vanessa kirby yeah who's a prostitute apparently 
<laughs> She's funny in this, though. She gives him that hot dog. Mm. And she, yeah, it's undercooked. Yeah. That was a weird, <laughs> was a weird scene. But I'm telling you, like, I don't know, it, so I guess, I don't know. And it only cost $12 million to make. And it made $88 million, so it made its money back. If Richard Curtis wanted to fund this, then a studio was like, oh, yeah, it's fine. We'll make our money back. Yeah. So I guess it makes sense, but I, I guess that's the reason it didn't do well, I guess, in the States, is because like, who is it for? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, there's I've, really no... It's the kind of movie I would pretty much recommend to anyone to watch, but I couldn't mm -hmm. pigeonhole like a set group who were like, this movie is going to be loved by these people. It's just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, look, but this movie's awesome. You should watch it. It's great. Sum up this movie in 20 words. Hmm. <laughs> that is, you know, that's the challenge. Right? I want to I wanna see if he can do it. Yeah. It's, um... <laughs> While you're thinking, uh, so this, uh, if you watch this movie, all the beach scenes were filmed in one day. I just want everyone to know that, which is insane. I don't know how Richard Curtis did that. And I well, kind of love it. And the shirt that get... Tom Hollander, wait, what's up? It's, uh, you know, in Britain, you know, you could get all four seasons in one day on a single beach, so you could get lots of different shots. It, it's fine. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's just crazy, though. That's a they move. They move fast on this. But I mean, so do I mean. You watch a lot of the the shows on the BBC. They're so polished, and I love yeah. just the work that they do on it. So the, I bet the crews just get out there and know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and they're filming. Um, they're filming like a new BBC drama just ran by my office the other day. Um, I wasn't like I've been to the office once since lockdown, but um, one of the guys has been going in quite a bit, and he was. He'd gone out for coffee and he was like sending phone footage of them like filming just outside our office, which is quite cool. And yeah, they nice. absolutely like knock them out. Um, the thing is, they don't have to do like the 20 something episodes that US shows have to do. Like, mm -hmm. they don't have to do these ultra long seasons. You know, I guess, well, Limited HBO, series. like, I guess HBO and Netflix now they do like shorter series like you know 10 episodes eight episodes etc but you don't have like the traditional like 23 episode season you know you have six episodes and that's it i love hearing stories about directors going over to the uk and working because you know, like they talk they're like the crafty table isn't as good in the uk as it is in the u.s but i think they're far more about moving quickly they yeah. don't have the mat like they'll stop though from what i've heard they stop for you know like tea and coffee and, and like a snack of every course. every once in a while and how could you not yeah. have a cup of tea like it's you know. i love it too it, the, i guess the hours aren't as insane i worked on a movie though where we started doing french hours which is only 10 hours a day and that felt like a complete revelation to me i was like i i'm only working like 13 hours a day because you have to show up before and leave after yeah so i'm like man i'm only doing like with a drive i'm like this is 15 hours total this is easy <laughs> i can i can get five hours of sleep like, that was my life. I was like, this oh, is man. beautiful. <laughs> so it's because before you're doing probably 18 hours. Man, so crazy. I'd love I... to go over there and have a nice. It killed me, man. It killed me. I don't it know really how did. you do that. Like, well, I do know, like, crunch time. I've had to do you know, 16, 18 hours days. But that's over the, you know, that's for one week, not, you know, over the course of three months. It murders you. And I got to tell you, you know, I made the choice to do it. And I worked on some cool movies. But I guess what keeps you around is the stories that you tell like, Oh yeah, I worked on these. I worked on this $200 million movie that made a billion dollars and I have stories or, I mean, it sometimes is exhilarating when you are given the task of getting 50 cars with 50 drivers to set, organizing them on set, then getting them to do all their driving during the set and nailing it. Like it's, it gets a little addictive of just, you know, being trusted with that much and then doing it. But you're cranky all the time. You just drink coffee. Your teeth turn yellow, uh, and you just uh, you never see anybody. And then you're cranky. But you make money. But you can't really enjoy that money. And then you're cranky. But no, I guess what I'm I guess what I'm saying about time. I just it it seems like a very relaxed set to work with him. Yeah. Because he's such a pro. So I would have loved to have done this. And also, I thought it was interesting too. Did what did you think about the cinematography in this movie? It was. Very non blockbustery, I think is how I'd put it. It's you know, much more like indie, kind of like what you would typically see from an indie film. You know, the camera was given like a lot more room to breathe. You weren't having these like big wide shots and stuff. It was, you know, 
much more personal, I guess, is how I'd put it. You you nailed it. That's exactly it. So you did no research, and you 